What's the best mirrorless camera for shooting sports? We've tested six of them and I'm gonna rank them from worst to best. Why are people shooting mirrorless for sports nowadays? It used to be mirrorless was terrible. Mirrorless used to be just for having a smaller compact camera and that's not the case anymore. Now there are huge advantages that make mirrorless the way to go for a lot of sports shooters. First of all, the electronic viewfinder means that there's no chimping. You know for sure as you're shooting whether you got the exposure. Second, the focusing points go edge to edge, which means even if you wanna do a creative composition with your subject on the left or right side of the frame, it's gonna be okay. That gives you a lot more flexibility for shooting. Third, there can be no blackout time on some of these cameras. Instead of having the mirror of a DSLR flipping up and down, cutting out your view, now you get a constant live feed like you're watching a video and just a little indicator that you're taking a picture. That's amazing. With no mirror there to flip up and down, the frames per second can be much higher too. And in fact, one of these cameras shoots stills at 30 frames per second. That's something you could never do with an SLR. These cameras can all also shoot sports silently. If you shoot golf or other types of quiet sports, that silent shooting might be a requirement and if nothing else, it's considerate of the other people watching the game. This is a real, real world review, which means I didn't have a camera crew following me when I was actually testing the cameras. I was just shooting sports, trying my best, using different combinations, tweaking the focusing systems. I communicated with the camera manufacturers on every single camera to make sure that I was using it in an optimal way, and I went back and forth with them when some troubleshooting was necessary. If you have a complaint, stay until the end of the video when I'll talk to you and address some common concerns. Number six here, the worst performing camera of the group, is the Canon EOS R. While it's a good all-around camera, it has some serious problems when it comes to sports. The biggest of which is when I start shooting, the frames per second drops down to about two and a half frames per second. That's really slow, like entry-level $300 camera slow. And most of those frames were in focus. The focusing system is slow, but accurate. And I know the manufacturer claims the frames per second is much higher, but what I found in the real world was that the time it took between frames to focus on the subject and keep it in focus was enough to substantially slow it down. The problems with this camera for sports don't end there. It completely lacks a thumbstick. To select a particular subject, which you often have to do when shooting sports, you want to focus just on the one player who currently has the ball wherever the action is and not on any of the opponents. With no thumbstick, you have to drag your thumb along the corner of the touchscreen, and that works okay. Except that it's a little bit slow, and to get from the left side of the frame to the right side of the frame, a common task in shooting sports, required me often to swipe my thumb across it multiple different times, and by the time I got the focusing point to where I wanted it, I would have missed the action, because you really only have a split second. One other major problem for shooting sports, especially if you're serious about it, is that there is only a single card slot. That means that if the card fails, you lose all of your pictures from the game. And if that game happened to be a really big moment, you're going to be really disappointed. Just something to keep in mind for those of you who do want an instantaneous backup of your data. Another benefit of the Canon EOS R is that with an adapter, you can put on any of the Canon DSLR lenses. And Canon is the staple for sports photographers with the biggest lineup of lenses. It worked equally well with native and adapted lenses. However, it didn't focus nearly as well as their DSLRs. So if you have a good collection of Canon lenses and you do shoot sports, I'm gonna suggest you keep shooting with your 7D Mark II or 1DX Mark II. Those were my experiences with the 70 to 200 and a 1.4 teleconverter, which is what the equivalent of which is what I use for all these cameras. We also tested it for wildlife with a 600 millimeter F4 lens and it got really bad, basically unusable. So the more telephoto you get, the more challenges you're gonna have. So if you're a sports shooter shooting at 300 or 400 millimeters, definitely rule this one out. On to number five. The number five mirrorless camera for sports shooters is the Nikon Z7. With 45 megapixels and the best image quality we've ever tested on a mirrorless camera, the Z7 sounds fantastic. And in fact, it should do a full 10 frames per second, but again, it takes a, a bit of time between shots to make sure that it has focus on a subject. And that made it drop down to an effective four frames per second. Beyond that, it only got about 60% of those frames in focus, which meant the effective frames per second was about two and a half in focus frames per second, which is roughly equal to what I got out of the Canon EOS R. 
So it does have a few advantages over the EOS R, which made me rank it above it. It has more megapixels, which meant I could crop more, which meant my pictures were a little more detailed. It also has a thumbstick on the back of the camera, and that thumbstick made it a little easier for me to select a focusing point. Both these cameras have the ability to track a subject as it moves side to side, a key fit feature of some of these mirrorless cameras. On the Z7, when you have the camera up to your eye, the user interface that Nikon chose for this, it makes it impractical. You have to push this OK button to lock onto a subject and then push it again to stop tracking a subject. And I tried that a couple of times and eventually just had to give up and go back to the old DSLR method of using the focusing point here. It's actually a huge step back from my favorite favorite sports focusing system, which is the Nikon D5 and Nikon D850. So if you do want to use all your Nikon glass, this will adapt them, but I would strongly recommend you stick with your D500, D850, or D5, all of which have the excellent Nikon 3D tracking system, which works better than anything we've ever tested. And of course, I have to mention, like the EOS R, this camera has a single card slot, which means you do not have the benefit of an instantaneous backup. Now, on to camera number four, the Sony A7 Mark III. At $2,000, it's cheaper than either of the previous two cameras. It has two card slots for those of you who want the instant backup. However, those card slots are also a bit of a disadvantage. While one is fairly fast, the other one is very slow. So if you're trying to write to, write to both cards at once, you will eventually run into buffering problems. If you're shooting a lot, and your buffering, you also can't enter the menu system or switch to recording video. The whole camera just kind of locks up and that buffering is kind of a constant problem. Though myself, I have learned to work around it. It's also a full frame camera, but Sony has a better selection of native glass. Those previous two cameras, both of them require you to adapt DSLR lenses if you're going to shoot sports, whereas Sony has a 7200 F2.8, a 7200 F4, and a variety of primes, including a 400 millimeter F2.8 and teleconverters, all designed for mirrorless. That 400 millimeter F2.8 in particular is amazing and focuses very, very fast. This camera shoots moving subjects with a live view through the viewfinder at about eight frames per second, ended up being about 5.2 sharp frames per second, meaning some portion of those frames were actually out of focus and it took some time between shots to actually refocus. So you never actually achieve that perfect manufacturer stated frames per second in real world continuous focusing sports conditions. If you're a serious sports photographer and you might need to continue shooting if you get stuck in the rain, the Sony might not be the best choice. They're not known for good weatherproofing, though I don't really have a good way to validate that because I'm not willing to soak all my cameras and see, and see which ones die first. Number three is the very closely related A7 R3, which looks identical to this camera and functions almost identically, but it has a 42 megapixel sensor instead of a 24 megapixel sensor. Those 42 megapixels mean I can crop down a little bit tighter. It also means I can do a 1.5 times crop, which I see in the viewfinder automatically and still maintain a high enough resolution to make shareable and printable pictures. So it's like having a constant teleconverter that I can turn on and off with a couple of button pushes. I really like that feature about the A7 R3. Both the a7 III and the a7R3 have what I would consider workable subject tracking. They can track a subject as it moves side to side in the frame, but it is not very reliable. It will lock onto the subject, but sometimes it's only for a split second. That still makes it more convenient than moving the thumbstick to try to keep up with a subject who's moving around in the frame. I did find it helpful, but if another player, even from a different team in a different jersey, runs in front of your player, it will lock onto them. And sometimes it will randomly lock onto the background or the ground. Nonetheless, I found it easier than trying to use the thumbstick all the time. The runner up, the second best mirrorless camera for sports that I've ever used is my favorite camera to use overall, the Fujifilm X-T3. It is amazing but it doesn't quite live up to the promises. It has 30 frames per second stills with no viewfinder blackout. No viewfinder blackout means the screen is completely in uninterrupted while you're shooting, meaning you just see a constant video while you're taking pictures, meaning the action is never interrupted, meaning you can follow the flow of the game better than you could with an SLR or any of the cameras that you've seen so far. It makes a big difference. If I'm looking through the camera and I'm trying to decide what's going to happen in the game next, I'll watch the eyes of the players on the field because they'll be looking towards the action and I know where to point the camera. 
when the view isn't interrupted, I'm a little bit better than that. It means I can get to the spot where I need to shoot just a split second earlier, and that can make the difference in pictures. But let's talk about the claim of 30 frames per second. Yes, technically it has a 30 frames per second mode, which does a 1.25 times crop, but it doesn't really live up to that in the sports scenario. It will shoot at 30 frames per second with AFS. And if you use back button focus, you can let off the back button focus button and it will shoot at a high frame per second. However, anytime you're using continuous autofocus and tracking moving subjects in real sports scenarios, the frames per second drops dramatically. I found that I consistently got 12 to 13 frames per second total. And then some portion of those were gonna be out of focus because no camera has perfect focusing. And that would put me at about eight and a half sharp frames per second. So that is better than any of the cameras we've seen so far, but it's still not fantastic. And it's nowhere near the claim of 30 frames per second. I didn't believe these results. I reached out to Fuji. I said, help me, what am I doing wrong? And it seems like everything is working correctly, but it does take the camera a split second, at least with this 50 to 140 lens to track focus. I confirmed this with other people on the internet. I reached out on Twitter. They got back to me, other people tested it, and they seems like if they were shooting real sports with this lens, they had similar results. Some people were using a wider angle lens, like a 50 millimeter lens, and they were getting up to 20 frames per second. Still nowhere near the 30 frames per second, but I want you to know that your mileage might vary depending on the conditions and the specific lens that you use. The Fuji's ability to track the subject moving side to side was only okay. It was probably roughly like the Sony's in that I finally decided it was worth using but it, at the same time, it frequently jumped to other players or the grass or the background. Nonetheless, while far shy of the marketed 30 frames per second, it is real that it does a better job than the Sony a7 III and the Sony a7R III, and it's cheaper. It's far cheaper than any of these cameras up to this point at $1,500. It also has some fantastic and very sharp glass, including this 50 to 140, which is probably what most sports shooters should be using. You don't really need to use a teleconverter on it because it does have that 1.25 times crop when you're using it in the sort of optimized for sports configuration that I like, but it's not a full frame camera. It has an APS-C sensor with a sensor that's less than half the size of all the other cameras that we're looking at today. And that means in low light, your images are gonna have more than twice as much visible noise. It also means the camera won't blur out the background quite as good, which means your subjects won't have quite the same pop separating it from the background, and that can be a big deal. Fuji can fix both those problems by releasing fast f1.8 zooms for sports users. I know they're already working on faster lenses because they've recently announced a fast 200 millimeter f2 lens, which will be equivalent to a 300 millimeter f2.8 lens, basically. And that is full frame equivalent fast, and it sounds fantastic. I can't wait to try it out for some sports, especially with this amazing body. Like the Sony's, this camera has two card slots, and you know what? They're both fast, so if you decide to shoot raw for sports, you're gonna have a better time of it. You know why we have the quick release plate on this? Because that's what we've been filming with, because it has great autofocus and it shoots at 4K and 60 frames per second. It's also an amazing video cam. If you wanna win one of these, you can head to freesdp.com. We're giving away one of these or the Canon EOS R that we started this whole thing with. And my number one mirrorless sports camera of all time, the one that I've taken more than 60,000 just my personal shots on, is the amazing 20 frames per second Sony A9. It is remarkable. When we first used it, it completely blew us away. It was the first camera we ever saw that had the no blackout in the viewfinder. And I immediately thought, I can never ever pick up a 1DX Mark II or Nikon D5 again. Those were previously my favorite sports cameras, but when you have a constant visual feed, you're so much more in tune with the game. You have a sense for where things are going in the game. You can follow the flow better because you can see all the player's expressions with absolutely no interruption. It really is a very practical improvement. It has 20 frames per second, and with some lenses, it will actually achieve 20 in-focus frames per second. Specifically, the Sony 400 millimeter f2.8 is just amazing to shoot with. It does very well with the 7200 f2.8, but the 400 millimeter f2.8 is remarkably fast. And those 20 frames per second are the difference between getting a great shot and getting a good shot. 
look, I would not complain if it was 100 frames per second because things, especially in professional sports, move very, very fast. There is no trying to time it. You try to get the subject in focus before the action happens and then you hold down the shutter and you hope you're lucky enough to get that split fraction of a second, that decisive moment. That's what really makes a difference and there is no camera that's better at delivering that than the Sony A9. Of course it has two card slots, of course it has a thumbstick. The only catch to it is, it's $4,000. So the X-T3, $1,500, presents an incredible bargain. And even though the X-T3 specs are better, the A9 actually does better, but at less than half the price, I'm gonna be pushing most people to the lower priced X-T3, which is also a great all around camera and generally more of a joy to use than the workhorse that is the Sony A9. I hope you found this helpful. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, write it down below. I'd love to hear what your favorite sports camera is and why. We have more mirrorless camera reviews coming up. This is just part of our overall testing that will lead to a big review for each of these cameras, but this is how we find out how they perform in different situations, and we're just trying to get you the results as soon as possible. So subscribe to see those videos. And don't forget, you can go to freesdp.com to win a couple of these cameras. Bye. All right, thanks for sticking in. Like an annoying teenager, I'm gonna be looking at my phone this whole time because it has your comments from the future. Yes, I know what you're gonna write because I've been a YouTuber for that long. First of all, if I've made any mistakes, check the pinned comment for this video. I will issue any corrections there. Second, many of you have asked, why didn't you use some other camera? Like you wanted to see the X-H1 or the A6500 or some other, I'm sorry, I didn't try to test every single camera, but I did have my reason. The X-H1 just isn't as good as the X-T3, and so we own it, but I didn't feel like I needed to put it in there. I do not like any of the Sony APS-C cameras for anything especially sports. The focusing systems are just flaky. They jump around and focus on the background. They don't have good thumbsticks at all. So they just wouldn't have done well and I wouldn't recommend them. And so I just didn't bother. They're also not new. Real photographers only need one shot. This condescending comment from people who just want to pat themselves on the back for being a real photographer, I guess. If you're gonna make that condescending comment, then do me a favor, put a link to your sports action portfolio. Cause I don't care. Show me your awesome sports shots that you got with one single frame, and then I'll be impressed. Next comment. Tony only gets 60% in autofocus. He clearly doesn't know what he's doing. I get 100% in autofocus all the time. It must be a bad copy or idiot running the camera. No camera does 100% all the time under all circumstances. I scrutinize these, these pictures very closely. I zoom into two to one, and if it's not perfect, then I counted it as out of focus because I was interested in actual results. Me shooting a real sports event is not the same as you chasing your dog or kid around the living room. It's not the same. But did you even tweak the settings for using focus priority or release priority? I did tweak the settings. I tried every, everything. I used small focus points, bigger focus points, group focus points. I used release priority, focus priority. It turns out focus priority is the one you generally want. Release priority will result in a higher effective frames per second, but most of those shots will be out of focus and therefore you just have more to sort through and no better result. The default settings in all cases turned out to be the most effective. Often tweaking things like focusing speed would hurt the focusing or do no nothing, but I didn't find anything that produced noticeably better results in the games that I was shooting, which were soccer, mostly soccer. Next comment, some other reviewer says it focuses great. I guess that Tony doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, first of all, we're all different. There is no perfect way to test focusing. Uh, you can create objective scientific tests, but it's never gonna be a realistic test because it's not just about the camera's focusing speed. It's about being able to keep the correct subject in focus. It's about being able to use it in the real world, which is what I was trying to test. If you see somebody testing it and all they do is they show you the back of the camera and it draws a green box around the subject, all that tells you is the camera can draw a green box around the subject. Because I've done that and I review the pictures and they'll have the green box, but they'll be out of focus. Every single frame I took, the camera had confirmed it was in focus, but sometimes cameras miss focus. I'll also say a lot of the people who raved about 
some of these new cameras were ambassadors for the camera company. And I've had so many people write back to me, so-and-so said the Nikon Z7 focuses wonderfully. And then I look into it and they're an ambassador. And that's okay, listen to what they have to say, but know that they work for the camera company and they would not be allowed to say something like, it slows way down and misses a lot of focus. I'm an objective reviewer. That's what I do for you. I check the claims of the camera companies and tell you the truth because every company, every business ever exaggerates the performance of their devices. Okay, last comment. Why should I trust this guy? He doesn't even know how to say Nikon. First of all, I'm American. Nikon US officially pronounces it Nikon, including the president of the company whom I've talked with. When he's in America, he says Nikon. Z7 is the worldwide pronunciation for that. It's not Z7 anywhere in the world. I say soccer because if I said football, that would mean American football because I'm American. And finally, if I said Boca, I'm sure that I mispronounced it, but you don't need to keep reminding me. I know you would rather I say it different. Chill. I'm an American. This is my dialect. I don't nail the pronunciation and everything, but I think you can probably get the general gist of what I'm talking about. Okay, that's it. I appreciate all of your comments, especially the polite ones, and I'll talk to you later.